Uh, Jason Underwood from Pacific Biosciences, and he'll be talking about single cell isoform sequencing, SliceOSeq, identifies novel full length microRNA, uh, mRNAs in cell type specific expression. Thank you, Martin, and thanks to the organizers for selecting our abstract. Uh, and thank you for choosing me over the grizzly bear. Um, so today I'm going to tell you today about a collaborative project we've done, uh, myself working uh, closely with Evan Eichler's group uh, and Alex Pollan at the University of California, San Francisco, along with PacBio and Dolomite Biosciences. So it's no secret to this group of people that no matter which technology you're using to make the single cells, the knob that's getting turned to 11 now is the number of cells or the number of reads that go along with those cells. And so uh, as George mentioned earlier, a study was published last week using the sky RNA seq method with 2 million cells. And this has been transformative for complex tissues such as the brain and also especially, I think, for developmental biology. So what I'm going to tell you about today is where we're turning the knob down on the number of cells and turning the knob up on the, number, on the amount of information that's contained from those reads that come from sequencing. Uh, and that's because we want to capture information about isoforms. So the ways of going about sequencing in the single cell space are often through three prime tagging, which generates a small tag in the three prime UTR, uh, or the I term uh, transcriptional unit tagging, where there's short tags that are distributed along the entire molecule, often in introns as well. And you do capture some junction information to tell something about splicing. Um, however, this does not capture the incomplete isoform. And especially in tissues such as the brain, where there are complex transcription start sites, splicing, and polyadenylation choices, um, it would be nice to be able to capture all this information at once. So the platform I'm going to tell you about that we chose to, to carry out these studies was the DropSeq, um, which is very similar to PacBio's RNA-seq product, which we call IsoSeq, in that it generates full-length cDNAs using a TSO strand switch at the five prime end. Um, the difference here is that the oligos are immobilized on solid beads, and these also contain adjacent information for barcode and UMI. And so what happens then after this uh, PCR is hopefully you've generated full-length molecules, but usually you then destroy that information and sequence just the three prime end on the Illumina platform. So what we wanted to do is say, could we do DropSeq and then feed this into PacBio? Uh, so the DropSeq platform we chose to use was the Nadia, that's a commercially available DropSeq platform uh, from Dolomite Bio. Uh, and they're here at the meeting if you'd like to speak with them. And despite the shape of the machine, it is not a Panini press as well. Uh, so we wanted to take the molecules coming out of the system and see whether these generate a high-quality cDNA uh, product that would be worthy of sort of isoform analysis. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about some of the QC we've done along the way and then show you some data uh, of what this looks like. So we did sort of the standard experiment that was done in the first McCosco paper, which is to take two cell lines and mix them together uh, and uh, perform these uh, through the DropSeq, synthesize full-length cDNA, hopefully, and then sequence this either on the PacBioSQL or shear it and sequence it on the Illumina platform. And so, uh, at, as Mike told you earlier in the session, with our current uh, long read lengths, we go around the molecule a lot of times, and we can develop a really high consensus accuracy. And so we can finally call barcodes out of these reads at a uh, quite accurately. And so I'm, uh, the information that comes out of the CCS reads, about 70% of them contain all of the information that's in the uh, red boxes above. And this is the information that we really need uh, to do isoform uh, analysis. So we get long reads, so do these look like full-length cDNAs? And so to classify them, we use this software uh, called Sconti. And Sconti takes a reference transcriptome, in this case, mouse and human gen code, and compares the reads against 
those uh, reference transcripts. And so a really nice full length read would be an FSM or full splice match, meaning every single splice junction in that known reference is seen. Incomplete splice matches are also common,、uh, often because RT doesn't get all the way to the five prime end of the mRNA.、Um, and then there's these two classes of novels novel in catalog, meaning these are known splice sites, but we've never seen them join together in the reference database. Or novel not in catalog, meaning this is a new splice that has not been seen at all in gen code. So we took the experiment from the barnyard、uh, experiment. And we ran these through Sconti to classify what these long reads look like. And you can see that both the mouse and the human reads, about 60 to 70% of these co correspond to full splice matches.、Uh, and about 20% are these incomplete splice match type. And then 10% together constitute these novels. And this is actually quite similar to what we see when we do a bulk ISOSeq experiment、uh, starting with high quality RNA. So, this looked like something where we could do something interesting.、Uh, so, what we did is take this into、uh, an, a new and interesting biological system to test this. And so, the, what we used are cerebral organoids, which are a model for, humate, for primate brain development.、Uh, and the reason is that、uh, the human brain actually is, is, you can get samples and even developing brain samples. And the macaque brain, you can get these samples, but chimpanzee brain is not possible. It's our closest living relative, so that's where we'd like to know the most about this. And so, this is follow on work uh, from uh, the Eichler lab from last year、uh, with the high quality ape genomes, and then also from Alex Pollan's group,、uh, which actually just published a comparative、uh, report card, they call it, of gene expression changes between human and chimpanzee、uh, organoids. And so these organoids can be grown from iPS cells,、uh, and these were ones in this experiment over about six months. So these are about one micron, tiny little cells that are, can be classified into these various categories that are、um, hopefully echoing a lot of what's in the developing brain. So for this、uh, project, we now have switched on to the new、uh, SQL2 platform that Mike discussed earlier. And we sequenced two 8 million zero mode waveguide smart cells of each of the chimp and the human organoid samples. And these achieve very long read lengths, over 50 kilobases. And since the average molecule in a, in a single cell cDNA experiment is you know, 2 to、uh, 5 kb, maybe, we get very high consensus accuracy by going round and round the molecule. Uh, next, we wanted to take these reads we got out and classify them.、Uh, so, the CCS reads,、uh, we got about、uh, around five to six million of these CCS reads out of these two smart cells. And then we wanted to select the ones that are going to be the ones that are useful for our analysis. And so, we call these the full length non chimeric reads, or FLNCs. And we apply a filter that I'll describe、uh, a little bit as well. So, one of the filters we use is we take out spots where the RT started synthesis in a genomic poly A segment. So, if you're used to doing single cell RNA seq, you'll know this is very common, where an intron might contain three, four, five A's in a row, and you get priming of RT from that. We want to get rid of those because we want ones that are legitimate poly A tails. Next, there's known RT switching artifacts that Sconti can filter out. And then also, we want to get rid of unannotated non canonical junctions. So, what I mean by that is that if, if it does not show the, the splice site dinucleotides at the terminus of the intron that are known to be in the minor or major spliceosome, then we would filter those out. So, we take those reads and we deduplicate them, and this leads us with about 400,000 reads.、Uh, these are full length cDNA reads that correspond、uh, to these cells. And that this corresponds to about 14,000 unique genes when, when we compare this to gen code. But there's about four isoforms per gene with this. So,、uh, overall, we wanted to sort of, as I said earlier, turn down the knob of the number of cells. We shorted a shot for around 400 cells in these organoids to capture a number of different cell types. And so we called the barcodes from the CCS reads. And we called them from the, the、uh, Illumina sequencing, and we did not use them for、uh, each other to sort of do any correction or hunting for one another. And we found that most of those, the、uh, barcodes overlap. 
So uh, as you might predict, the, the uh, long reads, we don't get as many genes per cell. We're seeing about 315 genes per cell. Uh, if we look at the top 100 barcodes, it's about 729 uh, as an average. Now remember, this is genes per cell, so there could be many isoforms uh, in a single cell. So it's, it's a different type of data. And on the right, I've stretched out the, what came out of the drop seq input to see that, of course, that you're getting higher coverage. We sequence with many more reads uh, with the uh, Illumina platform. So when we compare now this organoid data against the reference transcriptomes, we see that full splice match and incomplete splice match are, again, the top categories. And then here I'm showing a histogram of the size of the full-length cDNAs that we're getting out of this uh, drop seq platform. And so you can see that the mean size is around 2 kb, which is quite uh, close to what it is for a normal uh, human bulk sample. And that, but there is an asymptote that stretches out to around 5 or 6 kb. So now we wanted to take a look at, are, do these reads look like they show the hallmarks of full-length cDNAs? So one of the things that I said earlier is we want to avoid this poly A from internally uh, uh, priming. So these RNAs should have legitimate poly A signals. So we looked upstream of the poly A tail, and we found the, the most common hexamers, which are corresponding nicely to the most common hexamers known in the literature for the polyadenylation signals. And these nicely localized uh, with a histogram around uh, 16 bases upstream uh, being the average. Um, so that uh, on the uh, other end of the molecule, we wanted to look at the transcription start sites. So did RT successfully get to the other end? Uh, and so of the full splice matches, almost 80% of them actually are showing co-localization in the genome with a cage tag. Uh, so this, of course, degrades as you get to these other splicing categories. But interestingly, I think the novel not in catalog, meaning these are new splices that have not seen, been seen before, even those full-length cDNAs had transcription fire at a known cage tag. So these, these constitute interesting isoforms. Uh, so that's the ends of the transcript. What about the splice junctions in between? So we remember with short reads, you kind of sometimes can capture a junction at a time. But in the long reads, we're actually hopefully capturing all the junctions in the molecule at the same time, many junctions uh, within uh, a single read. And so we compared all of those junctions to known junctions in GenCode. We saw 87% of them correspond to known ones. 13% is novel. This seemed a little over the top. So we said, OK, but GenCode's conservative. Let's look inside of what these cells are trying to be, which is the human developing brain. Uh, and so we took the single cell data set of developing cortex that's done on the Fluidine C1 platform where there are these sparse tags along the entire transcript. And there we could see another 3.8% uh, of our junctions could be seen in that data. And then we, th uh, we threw the book at it by saying, let's take uh, the Entropolis data set, which is a collection of junctions from 21,500 RNA-seq data sets. We could account for another 6%. And so there's still 2.8% of these uh, that are novel. So next, I'm going to just take you through, uh, in the last few minutes, a little bit about what these uh, reads look like and, and what we think we'll be able to do uh, we could do maybe with this kind of data. So uh, on chromosome 17, this what uh, we thought would be a relatively boring gene, which is the elongation, uh, this translation factor, EIF4H. But when we uh, went to this, you can see there's reads that are able to be assigned to all of these different cell types in both the chimp in, in orange at the top and the human at the bottom in purple. And you can see that we occasionally see that alternative exon uh, down at exon 4. Um, in some of the, the transcripts. However, something that we noticed in this, what would supposedly be a boring gene, is that if we zoom in upon the 3' prime UTR, we could see this novel junction, which is actually we see commonly in both human and chimp data, which is an intron in the 3' prime UTR of EIF4H. And so this is a strange case uh, because EIF4H, you would think, would, would not have something to sort of turn itself off, because a 3' prime intron, U, uh, 3 prime, uh, UTR intron actually triggers the nonsense decay pathway and would be predicted to just turn down this transcript uh, greatly. But 
perhaps this is actually a gene regulatory mechanism, because once I looked more deeply into EIF4H, it turns out to be a translation factor that's not so boring. It's actually quite highly overexpressed uh, in some cancers, especially uh, particularly young, lung cancers. So if we travel right next door on chromosome 17 to the tropoelastin gene, you can see how we can use this data to look at cell type specificity. So tropoelastin is normally not expressed in many different uh, cell types in the brain, but we do, it is occasionally seen in astrocytes. And again, we only see this in this case in the human uh, astrocytes. Here I'm only showing human just to be simple because as you can see, there's a lot of different isoforms that we, we both see in our data and also has been seen in gen code. And so you can see that there's three different exon, uh, cassette exon events that are within the coding space that we can observe within this data uh, and trace back to single isoforms. And then additionally, we can see post, uh, uh, sorry, on the UTR ends, both the transcription start site vary and the three prime UTR vary. Uh, and we can see that that data is all collected on one molecule uh, of, of data at the same time. And so these are all uh, in, in code, uh, gen code transcripts. But again, this is, this is a 34 exon gene that we can observe the entire transcript in one read and assign it to sing with single cell information. Um, and finally, we wanted to leverage the fact that we did this uh, comparative analysis by doing both the chimpanzee and the human organoid at the same time. And so, uh, something that we observed in the data was that there are transcription start sites for this zinc finger gene, ZNF331, and we see those downstream transcription sites used in both the human reads and in chimpanzee reads, but we do not observe this upstream site, uh, this upstream transcription start site being used uh, at all in the chimpanzee. And we observe this as well in uh, junction data from short reads as well. Um, and this is an interesting candidate, we think, because in the short read RNA-seq data that we uh, had previously been uh, performed to compare chimp and human organoids, and also primary tissue comparing macaque with human, uh, similar data points, uh, or sorry, temporally, similar time points in cortex development in those cases, ZNF331 was seen as a gene that's up in the human. And so it could be, uh, it's tantalizing hypothesis that this additional expression of this gene could be because it's gained a new promoter uh, or new uh, first exon. Uh, so with that, I, I hope I've convinced you that we can turn the knobs, uh, turn the number of cells down, and turn the amount of information up. Uh, we've been able to deploy the, the uh, Sorry, I use deploy, and I, I, sh I, I mean, compared to the Africa talk, I just shouldn't even use deploy anymore. That's so impressive. <laughs> um, so we were able to use the dolomite uh, drop seek uh, apparatus to make these single cell libraries, and these libraries do show hallmarks that look a lot like full link cDNAs. Uh, and then the PacBio long reads that give us these uh, very long, long reads that go around and round and give us high barcode accuracy gives us a lot of opportunity to finally assign these reads to single cells. Uh, and so um, this is sort of a tech development project. We're using this on uh, the organoids, but I think that new biology waits probably in many different uh, areas of single cell biology, where so far it's been about gene expression counting, uh, but now you could also bring this towards specific isoform expressions. And as, as Hogg and Tilgner talked uh, the other day of using this in the mouse brain, this is an extremely uh, diverse splicing landscape. And so this is a great place where long reads uh, can really make, a, a, I think, a, an impact. And with that, I want to acknowledge the, the folks that did this work. Uh, I did this uh, in conjunction with Evan Eichler's group and Alex Pollan's group. Uh, Alex Pollan's group are experts at growing these cerebral organoids. Uh, and then Callum Mars uh, helped us do all these experiments with the dolomite uh, machine at UCSF. Uh, and 
they are here at the meeting. If you'd like to see one of these machines, they, they have a suite here. Uh, and then Liz is also at the meeting. Uh, Liz from PacBio is sort of the all things ISOSeq informatics, and she's modified a lot of her existing scripts to be able to pull barcode, pull UMI information, uh, and that's really going to be useful uh, to lots of people in the community. And then Brendan Galvin per for performing all of these nice ADEM runs uh, at the PacBio headquarters uh, for me. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions or if you want to get to the, the wine and beer, I understand that as well. <laughs> Thank you. So any questions uh, from the audience? So I, I, I have a question. So yeah. you know, what's interesting in, in, in these technologies, the long read phasing uh, uh, RNA uh, reads, is the, is the discovery of all the novel uh, isoforms. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of puzzling since the RT process is the same. So when you call them novel, are you saying it's a novel phased combination of exons or you're actually detecting new uh, transcribed regions of the genome? Right. So we, we actually do see both of those cases in long read transcriptome data. So uh, some of these cases, I think uh, perhaps that EIF4H is an example where it's lowly expressed because it's usually degraded. Um, Often, you know, the short reads depend upon, on a split map, they depend upon uniqueness of sort of the camer on both ends to uniquely anchor it. And I think in certain regions of the genome, particularly this one in the three prime UTR type regions where there's more repetitive content, you do often, I think, lose uniqueness of split mapping um, of the junctions. Whereas the long reads, because they have the contiguous information, they just map a lot better. Mm -hmm. And then as far as uniqueness of isoforms, we do often see repeat regions of the genome um, that are being transcribed, that by short read data are have not been picked up because it's really a multi-mapping problem where you just don't have a camer to map uniquely to one place in the genome. So these get called map quality zero. Um, if you have a long read that gets far enough away that you can anchor to a unique site in the genome, Boom, this now anchors, this can now map, and now it's a transcript. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So if there are no other questions, please join me in thanking Jason and all the speakers for today's fantastic session. <clears throat> so as was mentioned, uh, this is the last talk. Please, please go enjoy yourself for the rest of the evening. We'll uh, start tomorrow morning for the genetics plenary uh, in this room uh, at 9 a.m. <laughs>